Hi, Bertie. Hiya, Bill. Hi. How are you? Look at this. <laughs> this is a picture of us. At Dublin Castle. I remember that night well. I promised when I ran for president that I would appoint a special envoy and that uh, I would seriously consider a visa for Jerry Adams. Uh, most people thought it was just politics with the Irish community in New York. But it was more than that. I, I realized that the size of the American diaspora and the level of investment we had in the North were so significant that we might be able to really make a difference. So I had turned down a visa for Jerry Adams in my first year in office. But by the beginning of the second year, I was convinced that we had to do something like that to try to rope Sinn Féin in because if they weren't really for some sort of agreement, we were never going to get it. John Hume told me he thought I ought to do it. And uh, the then Taoiseach, uh, who was Albert Reynolds, thought I should do it. But a lot of Americans didn't want me to do it, including uh, the Irish American Speaker of the House, Tom Foley, and more importantly, the entire State Department. And I had appointed Admiral William Crow, who had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and had endorsed me for president, which was really important to me because he gave me national security credibility when the Republicans were attacking me. So we had American politics to play out. The State Department was in a panic that I would do this and destroy the special relationship with England. The British press was full of stories saying <laughs> that I was just doing it to get back on John Major because he had agreed to go through my passport files for the Republicans during the 92 campaign in America because they alleged that I tried to give up my American passport and go to the Soviet Union to continue my opposition to the Vietnam War. It was all hokum. It, there was nothing to any of it. And I wasn't mad at Major. He and Bush were friends, and he tried to help him. It was, I knew what was going on. And I also knew the story was phony. So I was happy to have them wasting time on something that was never going to come to anything. Uh, that was before fake news could actually be as effective as the truth. But anyway, it was a highly contentious thing. But I, I knew that we had to do something to get this process off the dime. And I give John Major a lot of credit for starting those talks in December of 91, I mean 92, before I took office. Uh, because as you remember, he had a very small majority in parliament and uh, the DUP, could have taken it away from him. They, in other words, the Northern Ireland could have brought his government down. But he risked it, and they stood with it. And then we had changes. Uh, Bruton supported the peace process. Then you became Taoiseach, and Tony Blair became prime minister. And there had been real progress in communications between the, the Irish nationalists and the Republicans. And so I began to think we could get something done, but it was rocky in the beginning. A lot of people thought I'd lost my mind when I did it. Well, it sure <laughs> did. It, it, it was rocky and difficult. I, I suppose one of the inspired actions that you took that stage was to convince George Mitchell um, to, to come and chair the talks, Bill. You, you you, yeah. you you might recall those days because like it it was so difficult for anyone to chair those talks, but uh, George Mitchell just had the patience of Jove. Well, George Mitchell, first of all, was a Senate Majority Leader in my first two years, and he basically uh, led the way to the narrowest possible enactment of my main campaign promise, which was to reverse Reaganomics, to reverse trickle-down economics, and get back to an invest-and-grow model that would focus on the middle class and giving poor people a chance to get into it. 
Yes. So we won that, and then we lost our efforts to provide universal access to health care. And so he left the Senate thinking that he had done all he could do, and he had recently married, and he wanted to make a go of it, be a good family man, provide for his family, and do other things. But I was devastated. I mean, I wanted to jump off one of those bridges on the Potomac River when he left the Senate because he was so good. <laughs> so I told him that I, I had this little part-time job for him that I wanted him to do. <laughs> uh, first to start out as the economic envoy. But I knew he'd drift into the politics and uh, eventually, both the Irish government, as you remember, and the British government supported his being the basically negotiator of what became the Good Friday Agreement. So <laughs> he, he never let me forget that that was the longest part-time job he'd ever had. <laughs> and that in the five years he served, he literally across the Atlantic a hundred times. I mean, he was there. And when he was needed full-time, he was there in the negotiations. So uh, I've always been grateful to him. He's still a good friend. He's 87 now, but his mind is sharp as a tack. And uh, we had a, a conversation just a couple of weeks ago, and, and I just... I marvel at how clear his grasp of what was going on was. One of the really significant things, Bill, was when it was when David Trimble stayed in the talks when he he could have you know he could have very easily pulled out of the talks and we would have been in in big trouble. The reason the others pulled out that time was because, particularly the DUP, was because Sinn Fein were coming in. I think you'd always said to me from, um, you know, even years before that, when this first ceasefire was on, when I met you, when I was leader of the opposition, that if we didn't have Sinn Féin in the talks, we were going nowhere. So I, I think... Nowhere. Uh, yeah. And and the visa, the visa was a key bit of that. But I think when you look back now in the space of 25 years, it really was a crucial, crucial thing to get them at the table. And I don't think I could have had much influence on it if I hadn't given Jerry Adams that visa to come because it was that enormous symbolic appeal and he promised not to raise money and he didn't. And he promised in the end to support peace and he did. And the Sinn Féin did. I'll never forget uh, a conversation you had with me. I still replay it in my mind after the terrible bombing in Omaha. And uh, it was done by the provisional IRA or the new, you know, a discontented offshoot. The dissidents. Yeah, and you told me that the IRA had uh, assured you that if they ever did anything like that again, they wouldn't have to worry about the British government coming after them because they were coming after them. And, you know, that and the way they handled the decommissioning in the end, although there were some rough spots along the way, convinced me that we could really do this. By and large, the peace process has has been very peaceful. It, it, it's the, the political process has been a bit more shaky. You know, until Brexit, we, we continue to, you know, have a very stable position. What's your your advice now, you know, how we handle things as we move forward? The Irish have proved on both sides incredibly uh, creative when they're working together and trying to work out what to do. As you know, when uh, Brexit was adopted, the Prime Minister David Cameron resigned because he had promised to bring it to a vote, but he was against it and he couldn't believe it would pass. And it was a sort of a harbinger of what was going on all around the world where people were uh, 
wanting to withdraw from one another and thinking their differences are more important than their common humanity. When the vote on Brexit occurred, the Northern Irish voted to stay. And they voted to stay in the EU by about the same margin they voted for the Good Friday Accord. And what I tried to argue, I guess, last in 2017 or 2018, was that we couldn't allow this to be a break. It, 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 uh, and it was up to the attitudes, the heart, the mind of the people of Ireland to decide what to do, and especially in the North. that It, it could be seen as a brick wall to run up against and be destroyed by, or as a high fence to jump over. <laughs> and I urge them to think of it as a fence to jump over, just another problem to solve. This is not unique, but the Irish response so far has been unique. And I credit the successors of, of Jerry Adams and Ian Paisley and David Trimble and others with trying to find a way through. My only advice here is when you live in a time of upheaval and inequality and you're trying to govern in a way that is inclusive, so you have shared economic progress, shared political participation, shared social justice commitments, so you have majority rule, minority rights, shared decision-making, shared benefits, and special relationships with both the Irish Republic and through them, the European Union, and the UK. It doesn't make any sense to give in to the ideologues and risk giving away what you've got. And I think the main thing the peace process has got going for it today even though we still don't have local government again, and we should, is that nobody wants to go back to what it was like. No one wants to run the risk. And that is a very good thing. That is the enduring memory of the troubles and what happened in the hopeful times of the 90s, as well as the, the ongoing problems has carried through a major financial crash that affected Ireland terribly and affected Northern Ireland and carried through the Brexit mentality sweeping the world, and you're still there. And I think that's what people have to remember.